welcome. This video shows you from start to finish all the steps I took to make a metal dust collector. If you want to see my future blacksmithing projects, go ahead and subscribe. Whether you forge swords, knives, or even axes, you will end up in front of a belt sander. Grinding metal generates a lot of metal dust that will quickly cover all surfaces in your shop. Dust collection is the usual answer to this problem, but for grinding metal, the solution is not so easy. The metal sparks are quite hot and will burn and smolder at high temperatures, as you can see here. The solution is a dust collector made out of metal for metal dust. The main component is called a thin baffle, which assists in the mechanical separation of metal dust aided by gravity. The thin baffle has a cutout slot which allows the metal dust to drop. I will show you how to build that at the beginning of this video. The inlet converting from round to square will also take a fair bit of work. In this visualization, you can see how a lot of sparks drop out into the collection chamber through the cutout slot. The rest of the dust collector is basically just managing the suction and putting a large frame around the theme baffle. This video will take you through the whole process of building this metal dust collector, including some of the challenges I encountered. I hope you are ready for the journey. It will involve lots of sparks and even lasers. Instead of using water for a spark trap, this dust collector will be made from sheet metal and use a thin baffle to separate the metal dust. The ingredients are fairly straightforward. I'm using a blower with a steel impeller, see a link in the description, 16 gauge sheet metal and 1 inch angle iron. Tony and I will now construct the thin baffle from the aforementioned sheet metal. Unlike a cyclone separator, the thin baffle is much shorter and includes a bottom baffle that allows the dust to drop out, but prevents it from getting sucked back in. For the thin baffle, we need to create two 24-inch diameter circles from the 16-gauge sheet metal. On the bandsaw, we almost cut a complete circle using a simple jig we built, but stop short of cutting the complete circle to leave a raceway for the inlet. Since 16 gauge sheet metal is fairly thick, I am somewhat worried about bending the walls that will support the top and bottom circle that we are currently cutting out. While working on this project, I had looked into buying sheet metal tools, but the smaller sheet metal brakes and rollers are not rated for 16 gauge sheet metal. The tools that are, are much larger, heavier and more expensive. One circle is cut out, and where we stopped cutting is where the air inlet to the dust collector will be located. The size of the inlet will be 6 inch square, which is the same dimension as the height of the baffle and big enough to not significantly reduce airflow. For the baffle to work, the compartment into which the dust will drop needs to be airtight. Otherwise, airflow would move through the dropout in the baffle and prevent the operation. Now we are completing the bottom part of the baffle. The top part of the baffle will receive a 6 inch diameter circle in the middle, where the blower will be positioned and the bottom part of the baffle still needs more material removed to create a dropout. Before we do that, we need to cut a 6 inch wide strip of sheet metal that will form the outer wall of the baffle. Since we don't have a shear, we mounted a guide on the bandsaw table. Let's talk about the 6 inch hole in the middle of the sheet metal. Initially, we thought we would use a circular hole cutter attached to a drill. Unfortunately, my drill press does not have enough clearance, and stabilizing the drill by hand seemed impossible. Instead, we are cutting four 1/2 inch holes, and will use a sheet metal snip to create enough space for a nibbler. How convoluted. Another option could have been using a plasma cutter, but I no longer have access to one, and have not seen the need to buy one yet. However, I am pretty sure a plasma cutter will be a likely future acquisition. This is a good point in case for how proper tools can make everything move much faster. While the nippler works exceedingly well, getting the right turning radius took some practice. As a result, I am approaching the circle with multiple overlapping operations. And there we are, almost a perfect circle.
draw filing is pretty quick to remove the sharp and jagged edges left by the bandsaw. All this preparation is really just procrastination to avoid bending the strip of 6 inch white sheet metal into a circle. With this brilliant realization in mind, I proceeded to make myself a Frankenstein pyramid roller. It consists of three rolls where one sits on top and can be moved down to increase the bending amount. Ideally, I would have used a lathe and solid rolls, but that was not an option in this case. Instead, I welded something together from black plumbing pipe. Yuck. Nonetheless, it seems to get the job done and my vice grips constitute an almost perfect crank. What more could I want? I occasionally check how close I have come to the right radius, but in the end managed to slightly overbend the sheet metal anyway. It turned out that that was not really a problem and the jig I built for clamping took care of removing gaps in the joint. Usually when welding, the clamping setup is the interesting part that makes for a successful weld. Here you see a circle cut from plywood that I'm using as part of my clamping setup. The cut corners from the plywood circle are placed on the outside and allow me to press the sheet metal tightly together. I'm using a stitching approach to prevent the metal from getting too hot and from blowing through the walls with a welder. By and large, that seems to be going well, although the weld beads are somewhat ugly and need to be cleaned up later. I am slowly working my way around the circumference of the circle and reposition my plywood clamping jig as needed to get access. Inspecting the inside shows good penetration on the welds. What I forgot to mention was that the strip of sheet metal I had cut was only 3 feet long and not enough to make it all the way around. That's okay, I will just cut another piece and continue along. To match the remainder of the circle to the inlet, I will first weld in another wall. Since I don't have a break, that will make joining the bent wall to the inlet much easier. To bend the wall to the right radius, my cobbled together Frankenstein roller will have to do the job. I'm still surprised how well it is working. When bending metal, it's never possible to bend the whole piece evenly, and so the extra length to give the roller something to grab needs to be cut off. After placing the sheet metal into my little plywood jig, welding everything together is quite fast. There we go, the walls are completed and the only thing missing from the theme buffle is the bottom with the dropout where the metal dust can fall into the collection bin. The cutout is a 240 degree arc that stops at the inlet. Since I want to use my circle cutting jig on the bandsaw again, I need to figure out where the cuts need to be placed and where I need to make space for the bandsaw blade. Creating the opening for the blade requires many small cuts due to the limited turning radius of the blade I have installed. Once the opening is there, cutting the remainder of the circle is fortunately quite easy. At the moment, I am keeping a small tab to help with welding the bottom to the rest of the baffle, and I don't know yet if I remove it eventually or not. As I have some rigidity in the whole structure now, I only need to insert one of the plywood segments. Previously trying to clamp both of them with my parallel jaws clamp resulted in either one or the other frequently falling down before I could put on clamp pressure. Another video I am working on and which I am very excited about is to visualize the pattern welding process in sorts. I liked my visuals so much that I made myself a few t-shirts. If you like the design and would enjoy a t-shirt as well, follow the links in the description. I will figure out how to suspend the blower and the baffle from the frame that I will construct. 
I am removing the sheet metal stand and will build a frame from mild steel that can hold the whole blower so that the inlet points down as you can see here. I am taking down the distance between the screw holes so that I can drill the flat steel bar at the same distance and then hopefully fit everything together just correctly. Before I drill the holes I will carefully mark the center of the bar and then use a center punch to create a small indent for the drill bit. The blower is not really designed to run in this particular orientation, so it will be interesting to see if the impeller comes loose more easily when compared to operating it upright. For my other blowers, I definitely had to adjust the impeller using various set screws to prevent it from scraping the housing over the years. My somewhat simplistic idea to making the frame is to screw in the individual pieces and then just weld them together. To make it easier to fit the screws, I used drill bits with a slightly larger diameter. However, for this to be really of any benefit, I should have assured that I centered the screws on the holes. As I don't want to damage the finish on the blower housing, I'm just placing a couple of tack welds before taking the frame off and welding it together properly. The cross brace from angle iron is hopefully strong enough to stay upright under the weight of the blower, which is surprisingly heavy. That said, as the impeller is made from steel, perhaps it's not so surprising after all. As the frame will stick out of the metal dust collector, I'm giving it a coat of spray paint to make it look better. Now I have to figure out the overall frame of the Frankenstein machine. I want it to be on rollers and essentially clad in sheet metal held together by angle iron. Once I have tack welded the four pieces of angle iron in place, I can do a proper weld from the other side. There will be two of these frames, one for the bottom with rollers and the other one for the top where the blower will be suspended. To attach the four rollers, I will need to make some plates to which each roller can be screwed. Fortunately, there is a cutoff just perfect for the job, but that needs to be straightened a little bit first. None of this needs to be very precise. The most important bit is for the rollers to be level in the end. I am transferring the location of the screw holes to the plate and then will center punch and drill them. A drill press is really a great tool to have for drilling into steel. With a handheld drill, I usually blow out the holes by not being able to hold the drill completely steady. None of the welds here need to be particularly strong since they just need to hold the plate in place. However, since it's easy to do, I'm doing a complete weld against the seam. The saw horses make it easy to hold the frame and to clamp the plate for the rollers so that it does not move when welding. Clamping also still allows for small adjustments with the hammer to center the plate against the frame and ensure that there is easy access to the screw holes all the way around. Alright, after some cleanup, it's time to attach the rollers and see how it all fits together. Looks good. Now let's go back to the top frame and figure out a way to suspend the blower from the little frame you saw me make earlier. For this construction, I just end up using more angle iron as it is fairly rigid and still very easy to work with. Putting everything together is still a little bit difficult. Welding long seams has a tendency to warp the pieces due to the heat involved and clamping does not completely solve the problem. In this particular case, the frame lifted up a little bit and while the blower still fits, it's a little bit more difficult to attach than I would like. I need some more strength on the frame and will attach a couple more pieces of angle iron that can hold the frame for the blower in more places than just the one long seam I welded. With the blower in place, I cannot weld the bottom, 
So it's a little bit back and forth to completely weld everything. The remaining step in finishing the top frame is to weld two more cross braces in place that prevent the blower from tilting down under its own weight. This whole operation somewhat marred my beautiful paint job, so it's time for another black spray coat. I'm sure this will be the distinguishing mark for the whole project. After all this work, I wonder if the theme baffle will still fit. But more importantly, I need to figure out how high to make the dust collector based on how far off the floor I want the inlet to be. Afterwards, I just cut the legs to the right length and weld them to the top frame. The next challenge is welding the top and bottom frame so that everything is at the right angle and not skewed to one side or the other. A lot of clamping and the sawhorses will need to help here again. At this point, the overall frame is finished, and now I need to figure out how to make airtight compartments from sheet metal. In addition to weather stripping, I suspect some silicon cork may be required as well. First, however, let's get back to the challenge of cutting the sheet metal without a break. I am trying an electric shear here, but the 16 gauge sheet metal is pretty thick, cutting with the shear is quite slow. This will be the bottom piece, and I will just reuse the holes from the rollers to attach it. This time using a handheld drill rather than my drill press. You can see how much longer it takes to drill these holes, even though the sheet metal is quite thin in comparison. To attach the sheet metal against the plate for the rollers, I'm inserting a couple of spacers to fill up the gap. To attach the sheet metal to the angle iron frame, I'm cutting little steel squares with tapped quarter inch holes to which the sheet metal can be screwed. These get welded to the frame in multiple locations. While it would be much easier to just weld the sheet metal against the frame, I'm keeping the option to remove each sheet metal panel in case access is needed at a later point. This may be optimizing for something that could be very unlikely. However, as I'm building this as I go, without having a concrete plan, I'm sure I will forget some small detail that needs to be revisited. And besides, the option to weld continues to be available, and at that point the screws just become visible ornaments. Cutting 16 gauge sheet metal with an electric shear is quite challenging and takes a fairly long time. Better tools, such as a plasma cutter, would certainly be nice. The process for attaching the panel is the same as before. Little tack welded squares that receive screws to attach the panel. The next step is to place an inner wall that separates the dust chamber from a filter array that cleans the exhaust air. Duct tape is of course an essential ingredient to any project and needs to play a crucial role here as well. The angle iron in this case needs to be shaped for the circular tube from the blower. The belt sender makes short process of that task and a perfect fit is not important here. Time to cut the sheet metal again, and it's not getting any easier. The plasma cutter sure would be nice. Mm -hmm. 
After a lot of work, the hole is big enough and fits over the exhaust pipe. The sheet metal is a reasonable fit, but the chamber really needs to be airtight. And to help with that, I'm placing some weather stripping. Eventually, some silicon caulking might need to come into play as well. Once I'm done with that, I need to cut a few more pieces of sheet metal and also need to cut another circular hole, as well as a hole for the intake. With that prospect in mind, I finally broke down and realized that the plasma cutter is really a useful tool to have in the shop. Let's take a look at how that is working out. Let me tell you, it's really night and day. The circle is almost perfect and cleanup is minimal. This is so nice, I should have invested in the plasma cutter from the get-go. Some more weather stripping and we are getting close to doing a first test of the contraption. However, before that can happen, I still need to build the intake port, which will also support the buffer. The intake port will also need to be cut into the sheet metal panel that covers this side of the dust collector. Without the plasma cutter, cutting this precisely would have been difficult as well. Let's see how easy everything now seems to be. There we go, a panel cut to the right size with the correct opening for the intake port. Now it really gets to be the time to do a test run. I collected a ton of metal dust and shavings from the floor around the bandsaw. Let's see how much we can collect. The hope is that almost everything is just on the floor of the dust collection chamber and did not just get blown out. Let's take a look. I'm quite happy with the result. I'm currently cutting the panel that was covering the front side of the dust collector so that I can turn the lower part into a door to retrieve the collected metal dust. As I mentioned before, I do not have any sheet metal tools and I'm cobbling this together with whatever spare steel and tools I have in the shop. Most of the work here is no longer on the dust collection mechanics, but rather closing up the outside without too many air gaps. As I am making this up as I go, I attach most panels with screws so that they can be removed if I need to get back to the insides of the monster. I'm still wondering what I should call it in the end. Frankenstein comes to mind but that's a little bit long for a spray painted stencil. Instead of tapping the holes, I just tack weld a nut on the inside, which is fast and sufficient. Now that the upper part of the front panel is attached, I have to figure out the door. The hinges, which are starboard, should be fairly easy to attach. For now, I am center punching the holes and then we'll drill them on the drill press, which is much faster than drilling by hand. I plan on welding a nut on the inside again, so that the screws have something to tighten against. In principle, this is super easy. Tighten the screw against the nut and then a few easy tack welds, remove the screws, and done. Here is another questionable decision. I decided that I would weld the other side of the hinges instead of trying to drill in place nuts. 
My reasoning was that if I ever had to replace the hinges, I would just grind them off. We'll see how much of that will come to be true. I thought I would just buy some kind of latch at the hardware store, but they don't really have what I need. Instead, I'm taking inspiration from the trusty metal band saw in the shop and decide that forging the latch handle is the way to go. This is definitely one of the benefits of doing all the work in a blacksmith shop. While precision is something I'm limited on, creative transformation of steel is always an option. The flange I'm forging here is meant to secure the handle on the outside so that it does not move through the hole where the handle engages the latch. One of the challenges here is to keep everything centered. As you can see, I am off-center and will grind the excess away. To hold down the latch on the inside, I'm drilling a hole that I will tap for a quarter inch screw later. Before I can do that, and before I will attach the square latch driver, let's forge in the handle. There we go. Handle for the latch is finished, and instead of using the transformative power of blacksmithing, I will just weld on the square driver. As I had already drilled the hole, I now just need to tap it to cut in the threads for the coarse one quarter inch screw. One of the problems with this construction is that the sheet metal, while quite thick, is still pretty flexible. Ideally, I would have a bending break to bend the edges to give it more stability. I don't yet know if that's actually going to be a problem in terms of creating a vacuum inside of the dust collector. The one ingredient that is still missing is a piece of square steel that can move the latch. I will just weld that on. As you can see, I chamfer at the corners to have more surface area for welding. This should be sufficient for it to hold together. The chamfers are important as I need to file the weld beads back to the square of the steel and I need enough surface to still hold it together. The square hole for the latch is one half inch wide. I'm drilling a one half inch wide hole and will then use more hot work to drift it to square. Overall, drifting is much faster than firework or using square brooches, and precision is not really a primary consideration here. Finally, I need to create a large enough hole in the sheet metal as well, and that will require filing as I don't have any larger drill bits at the shop. Let's put it together and see how well it works. There is not all that much work remaining. I have to close up all sides, make a place for the filters to go and make an inlet. My process is the same. Drill the holes all the way through the angle iron and weld a nut on the inside for the screw to grip. I had a little bit of a transition, but some weather stripping will close that up. I told you, I'm just cobbling it together. As I had mentioned before, the thin buffer is meant to separate out most of the metal dust. To test this, I just collected whatever had accumulated underneath the grinder. As I turn the dust collector on, observe the exhaust of it. I was quite surprised how much fine dust made it all the way through. It's not really surprising though. However, most of the stuff is at the bottom and waiting to be taken out. The filters should take care of the fine dust. In addition to the mechanical separation of dust, I also plan to install two stages of filtering to the exhaust air. The first filter stage filters out particles larger than 5 micron, and the final filter stage steps it down to 1 micron. This whole project is not designed and rather follows the slap it together philosophy of construction. Here, I'm creating the box that will hold the filters. 
angle iron that gets welded into place works quite well for that. The main challenge will be the mechanism for holding the filters in place, while also allowing simple replacement of filters as needed. My solution to keeping the filters in place is to weld a tab on the top cover that presses the filters together at the top. Simple, but effective. Checking by hand seems to indicate that they will stay firmly in place without any movement between the filter stages. The only work remaining is really just to close everything up. You can actually tell by the interruption in the plasma stream where I'm not fully cutting through the 16 gauge thick sheet metal. For this particular project, that's all okay though. In terms of safety, I'm using a low profile mask to filter out fine particles from the air I'm breathing. When I recorded this video in California, we had fires all over the place, and the general air around where I live was not healthy to breathe either. As before, I tack weld a nut in the back and that's it. There was one challenge though, I needed a screw to hold the cover in place right underneath the filter box and I could not quite reach that with the welder, so I need a little help, you will see. With the temporary tack weld in place, I can properly weld the front and then just get rid of the tack welded helper piece. There we go. The only remaining item that is left is an inlet. If you recall, the theme baffle had a 6 inch square opening and I'm now trying to adapt it to a 6 inch diameter round inlet. I took some sheet metal and rolled it on my homemade roller and now just weld the seam. Without any sheet metal tools, my bending operations are a little bit odd. I now need to create the square box on which I will establish the transition to a round profile. The idea here is that I will make four cuts into the round profile and bend the pieces of the inlet so that they align with the square box. 16 gauge sheet metal is surprisingly thick and this would have been much easier to do under heat. Actually, the whole construction from square to round transition could have been done using a single sheet of metal and a bending break. Anyway, with a lot of welding, I'm thinking of the welder as a metal printer that fills in all my gaps of imprecision, the inlet slowly comes together. It does not look pretty, but it will work. The remaining work for the inlet is a base plate that I can attach to the metal dust collector with screws. The plasma cutter is handy to just quickly cut it out. I'm using a piece of straight steel to guide the cut, which is definitely better than my wobbly hands. I am using the existing cover to place the screw holes and will drill those with the cover in place as a template. At least the holes should match up then. Now I just need to cut away the inside. Yes, the plasma cutter will do that for me again. And then weld the base plate to the inlet and voila, inlet is ready for action. It is interesting that I can get away with so much inaccuracy. On the other hand, it also makes this project very forgiving and means that in my limited time I can make steady progress. The inlet is a little bit long and I'm cutting it to a shorter length with a cutting disc. This way it will not stick out too much from the dust collector but will still leave me enough room to connect pipes. With all the pieces done, I figured I would take care of the optics of it as well. With the help of my wife, I chose a very cool performance boosting two color scheme. This is my first time to play with director metal paint and I get to use a high volume, low pressure spray gun that has been unused for almost a decade. The shop is not really meant for hanging anything. So I repurposed some of the construction table tubes and my saw horses with a couple adapters that I quickly welded together. Before I can paint the sheet metal, I need to remove the grime from it using an industrial degreaser that is working quite well. Another interesting challenge that I did not foresee was that with the limited space in the shop and the existing lighting, it was somewhat difficult to see what I was doing. 
To protect my lungs, I was also wearing my positive pressure respirator with organic vapor filters. The face shield was hard to see through as well, so I mostly was guessing at overlapping the paint while spraying. Nonetheless, it was working quite well, and two coats of paint seemed to be fully sufficient. The rest of the dust collector will be sprayed with an accent color. To be honest, the coloring is mostly just for fun, but I am hoping that it will provide at least some rust protection as well. To protect the windings and the nuts, I placed some painter's tape. Those areas will not be painted, but they will also not be visible. My other hope is that the paint will make the inlet a little bit less ugly as well. Overall, this works surprisingly well and does not use a lot of paint. Much, much better than just spray cans. There you have it, everything painted and just waiting for assembly. Putting everything back together took much longer than I thought, and I needed to replace a few nuts as well. Instead of putting it back together with screws, I just used medium carbon bolts with hex heads. Anyway, here it is all put together. Since it's a mighty machine, it cannot be complete without at least some stencils. This was also a fun opportunity to design stencils on the computer and 3D print them. I jury rigged the dust collector and gave it a test run. There is still more work to be done, but I figured we should see it in action at least once. This definitely argues for a movable intake that I can place based on the stream of sparks. Let's try again. We can definitely see that most of the sparks make it into the intake. However, that seems to be the case even without suction. More testing is needed here, and it will involve lasers. I have had the dust collector in use now for a few months and wanted to get the sense of how well it is working. Ideally, I would find a way to measure how much of the grinding dust ends up in the dust collector and how much of it remains in the air and potentially gets into my lungs. You can see here how a beam of sunlight clearly shows the dust suspended in the air. Maybe there is something I can do with that. A beam of strong light sounds like a laser to me. So indeed, I set up a 50 millivolt laser with a diffraction pattern that fans it out into a plane. Here you can see how easily it highlights the smoke from the coal forge. It looks quite pretty, so let's watch it for a bit. Let's see if we can measure the performance of the dust collector by laser. You can see that the laser picks up some clay I sprinkled into the air, but let's see how well it works with grinding dust. Not very well at all. Part of it is that the laser is not strong enough, and the grinding dust is probably low albedo as well. 
here is the comparison without running the dust collector. I was hoping to count the frequencies of particles near the laser, but it seems to be about the same. I'm trying it with clay again, with the dust collector on and off. It's really hard to see though. However, I can say that in practice, the intake shoot ends up collecting a lot of the grinding sparks, and there's definitely much less of it to be found on the floor. In terms of using a laser to count the amount of suspended grinding stuff in the air, well, that clearly was not successful, but still worth a try. In the end, I used some compressed air to chase more of the clay that is now all over the place into the dust collector that created some pretty pictures as well. My next videos will go back to blacksmithing. I'm forging a few tools that will help with forging axes and are good blacksmithing for beginners projects. You may also want to check out the video which I'm giving away a Mandalorian Beskar ingot. Until then, perhaps check out some of my videos on forging Viking Age swords or spears. They are quite detailed and give you a good sense of all the skill involved in creating them. For now, I'm done with making videos on the Dust Collector, but it is a new and well-working tool in the shop. Hopefully it will help for everything to stay a little bit cleaner. As always, thanks to everyone on Patreon. If you are interested, you can find updates and pictures there, and you will also get access to these videos a few days early. See you next time.